I could really sense this morning when I walked in and we started worshiping, I could really sense that something had shifted in the atmosphere. I don't know whether you experienced it, but there's, there's been, um, there's a breakthrough anointing on your, um, on your ministry. And uh, I could really sense this, this morning that we've, we've taken huge leaps forward spiritually. So thank you for that. Um, we've got friends, they've got a church in Corpus Christi and they minister, uh, it's uh, at the Gulf of Mexico in Texas. Uh, Bill Cornelius, and whenever he preaches a very, very, very good sermon, his wife would come to him and tell him, listen, this morning, you were the sermonator. Uh, <laughs> but I would just, <laughs> yeah, but I would just like to say, Alex and Mark, you were the sermonators this morning, so let's give them a hand. <laughs> you guys were amazing. Um, and obviously, there's no pressure now, you know, so, yeah. Okay, I'm going to share a highly, highly embarrassing story out of my life. Uh, no, seriously, it's an extremely embarrassing story. It's a true story. Um, but there's a very good reason for me sharing it, because there's something that I would like to minister. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was something that God said that he wants to minister to the people that's going to be here today. So that's why I'm sharing this story, and it's, uh, um, so I'm going to be very open and very, very uh, vulnerable. Okay. Um, in 2009, towards the end of September, the one Monday evening, I started feeling uh, a, a sort of a tingling sensation on the left-hand side of my face. And I thought, you know, being a dad of girls, sometimes I have to lie there in bed, and it's cucumbers and stuff all over the, and I just have to lie quiet and, and pretend that I enjoy it, you know. So um, when the girls were little, they, they really enjoyed that. But anyway, so I thought, did they put something onto my face that is irritating me? Anyway, and the next day, it, it started progressively getting worse. And on the uh, Wednesday morning, I got up, and I actually had lost most of my speech, and I really battled speaking. So I kept it quiet. I didn't say anything to Eloise. And then I told her, listen, this is what's going on. It wasn't an hour. And I was sitting right in the doctor's consulting rooms. And, and she was um, <clears throat> doing an examination. And uh, during that initial examination, they thought, no, it might be something like Bell's palsy. So, so uh, she started treating me for that. And then the next, the next morning, I got that uh, sensation in my left arm. Uh, the next day, it, it went through to on the left-hand side of my leg as well. And to cut a long story short, um, for, for the next four months, I was in and out of hospitals. I was at Flora Clinic. I was at Krugersdorp Hospital. I was in Volgevel Hospital. Um, I had different physicians, neurologists that um, did all sorts, of, and all sorts of wonderful tests on me. And they, they couldn't ascertain as to ex exactly what is wrong. Uh, initially, they thought it, because it presented exactly like uh, stroke-like symptoms. So they thought it might be a stroke, but they, um, that was cancelled out. And um, one of the first things that we as human beings did, the first thing that Adam, Adam and Eve did was to give names Names to the animals. So we have this desire in us that when something goes wrong or you need a diagnosis, we need to get a name. We might not understand the name that the doctors give us, but as soon as we get a name, we think we can wrap our heads around it. And one of the things that was extremely difficult was that they couldn't, they couldn't pinpoint a diagnosis. So... Okay, four months, I'm out of action, not working, I'm feeling extremely ill, um, and then after four months, I started working, and, and, and to cut a long story short, they basically just felt um, it, was a, it was a virus that attacked my uh, nervous system, and one of the scans showed a, a spot right in my midbrain. And later, it also affected my handwriting on the right-hand side as well. I actually have one of my Bibles. Um, it looks as if a five-year-old five year had scribbled in my Bible, you know, so it looked terrible. Um, and initially, they, the doctors told me that they think it's, it's going to take a long time to, to recover from what has happened. And I thought, oh, man, 
I'm not, I'm not taking this. I'm not going to stand on this. Um, I've got a healing anointing on my life. Um, I'm going to trust God that he will heal me. But for the next few years, I really, really struggled physically. And I battled extreme fatigue. So much so that most of the days that I couldn't put in a full day's work. So I'll work till 2 or 3 o'clock and then I'll quickly go home, get a nap. And then I'll, 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 I'll be busy in the, the evenings again. So I really, really, really battled with my, with my health. And I was praying about it. And it was a struggle because your mind is young. And, and you've got these desires. And you want, want to do certain things for God. But your body is not functioning. And your body is not co- cooperating. In that time, um, I read about Elijah. And Elijah, after having confronted the Baal prophets... And the next day, he's lying underneath the tree and he's actually praying, Lord, please come and fetch me. So in this time, battling for a few years, battling with this extreme fatigue, really battling to function decently. So I thought, well, okay, well, how, how, more, how much more biblical do you want it? I mean, it's in the Bible. He, Elijah prayed it. I mean, it was Elijah and Moses on the, on the, on the Mount of Transfiguration. I mean... Those two guys, so we can probably take a few cues from them. And there was a few instances that I actually, that I actually prayed and I said, Lord, yes, it's been such a struggle. It's been such a battle. And Lord, just, don't you just want to come and take me? That's really how I felt. And I had prayed it a few times and I clearly clearly, distinctly remembering the one time after having prayed uh, prayed it, I clearly heard God saying to me, stop, stop. I don't want you to pray this way. Being the obedient servant of God, (laughs) man of God, I actually had prayed it a few times after that. I want to fast forward a few years, and I'm feeling well. I had recovered. It's going well. I've got got a wonderful family, wonderful wife. Um, I'm part of a wonderful congregation, and things are going well. I'm not feeling well. So I, I don't have any hassles, not financially, not spiritually, not relationally, not in the church. Um, we've been blessed. Well, let, let's, let's just keep it there. So everything is going well. I'm feeling well, functioning well. And then I would used to get into bed at night. And the, the moment, and Eloise, normally uh, I'm, I'm asleep way before she's asleep. But there was quite a few instances that she was, she was sleeping, snoring very lightly. <laughs> very, uh, very ladylike. And, uh, and I was actually lying in bed, and I got these urges to commit suicide. I got these impulses, and it was so strong that there was, there was a few evenings that I was lying in bed there, and I was thinking, I'm going to get up now, I'm going to go to the kitchen, I'm going to look for a, life, a knife, and I'm going to slit my wrists. It was such, a, I can't tell you how strong an urge it was. And I was shocked about it. A few days later, and I felt so embarrassed about this that I didn't tell my wife. A few days later, I, I got the courage together and I told my wife what feelings I was having. And she just said, oh, well, you wouldn't have been successful. Though. Those knives are so blunt, it wouldn't have helped anyway. <laughs> So when I come to church, just give me a hug or two. You know, I don't get a lot of compassion at home, you know. (laughs) So, okay, well, you know, so I stopped feeling sorry for myself. Uh, (laughs) But I was extremely upset about these thoughts. So the one morning during my quiet time, I got quiet and 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 I asked God and I said, God, what on earth is going on with me? And I clearly, clearly 
heard him say to me, he said to me, you have come into agreement with the evil one. And because you have come into agreement with the evil one, he has the right to come and steal your life. I know we've been talking about taking ground, but I want to give you a recipe today for how to guaranteed to lose your ground. And if you want to lose your ground, come into agreement with the evil one. So now I feel, okay, this is what God is telling me. Now I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, you know what? I'm a pastor. Um, I, I serve God wholeheartedly. I read my Bible. I fast. I pray. I tithe. I pray for the sick. I, I do all the things that I do. Lord, and you telling me that I've come into agreement with the evil one. And I said, Lord, listen, you know, I'm, I've got a reformed background, so you need to give me some scripture here. Otherwise, you know, there's a very special place that we send people to that hear voices. <laughs> so I said, Lord, you better give me some scripture. Otherwise, I, 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 I think I'm really losing it now. And the moment I prayed it, Amos 3 came into my head. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? I couldn't remember whether it was Amos 3 verse 3 or 3 verse 8, and I quickly looked it up. Let's read it together. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? So these were the thoughts that I was having. This is the scripture that God had given me. And then... Basically, this is what God told me. He said, one of the principles that govern the spiritual world is the power of agreement. Most Christians are totally unaware of what a powerful force this is. It can be a source of good and blessing, but also a source of a lot of pain. It can build your life, but it can also ruin it. This principle can enhance your life if it's used in alignment with the word and God's will for our lives. But it can also destroy it if we unknowingly come into agreement with the enemy. So that's what I felt that morning. So I wrote it down. So that's what I felt God was telling me about this. So I'm going to share just three quick thoughts with you. Number one, the power of agreement can build or destroy your life. Okay. So now this is what God is busy with me. But now so I'm thinking, you know what, yes, Lord, this is, I'm battling to take this for myself. Um, you know, as I said, I'm a pastor, I'm committed, I love the Lord, I, I'm ser I try to serve Him wholeheartedly. Lord, is, is, is this really you? Is this, is this the principle? And then if, a few weeks later, I listened to a sermon of uh, Chris Vallotton. And in the sermon, he was talking about a habit that he had. And he said, during worship, during worship, he would go through the congregation. He would walk, walk up and down through the congregation. And then he would quietly just lay his hands on people during the worship. And, and as he walks through the congregation, laying his hand on, hands on the people, he would, just, he would just quietly pray for them. And at a certain stage, he came to a certain lady. And as he touched her, he immediately registered very strong suicidal thoughts. But he immediately knew he's spiritually mature, so he knows that sometimes the things that we feel and the sometimes the things that we experience, it's not us. You, uh, that's, the, that's, uh, that's the spirit of discernment. So he immediately discerned, but listen, there's, there's, there's something wrong with this lady. So very quietly and very discreet, discreetly, under worship, he asked her, I'm sorry, are you having suicidal thoughts? And she looked like she had seen a ghost. And this was one of the lifelong members. She, she had been part, part of Bethel Church from the beginning. She was a mature, committed follower of Christ. She was a stable Christian, very involved in the ministry, but she had looked as if she had seen a ghost. And she said, how do you know that? <laughs> so 
say he started praying for her. He broke that thing. He bound that thing. And after the prayer, she said, it, it just felt, it just felt as if a huge load had fallen off her shoulders. And then she said to him, but why on earth do I have these feelings? Because she told him during the worship that she had been going through an extremely difficult time. And, and she had been thinking of giving up. And she had actually started praying, Lord, come and fetch me. And this is the answer that he gave her. And he told her, because you sought your comfort in death and not from Holy Spirit, you came into agreement with the evil one and you have opened the door for him to come and torment you and even try to steal your life. And that was exactly the same thing that God had told me. So when it comes to agreement, it's so important. And when you go to Isaiah, Isaiah 28 actually says, then your covenant with death, you can come into agreement and you can actually unknowingly, you can make a covenant with death. And you will, and, and, it, and it will be annulled, and your agreement with Sheol. When, when the Bible, Bible used Sheol, it refers to Satan, it refers to hell. So unknowingly, we can come into agreement with the evil one and with hell. And we can't live there. So the power of agreement is one of the most powerful principles in the spiritual realm. It is also one of the principles that we are totally unaware of. I must be honest, I've never heard a sermon, I've never heard a sermon about agreement, and I've never read a book about agreement, but it's such an important spiritual principle. And what is amazing, yesterday afternoon on our, on our way back home after, um, after the, the day sessions, we had a long conversation with Alex in the car, and what were we talking about? We were talking about the power of agreement, or he was actually talking to us about the power of agreement. But we are totally unaware of this principle and how it works. Um, I think, Mark, you referred to it this morning, you referred to uh, the Tower of Babel. Now, what is amazing about the Tower of Babel, that there was a lot of unsaved, heathen, rebellious, prideful people getting together and they were in unity and they were in agreement and they decided that they're going to make a name for themselves. They're going to build a tower up, into, up until the heavens. And then God comes and, and, and he said, behold, they are one people. They are in agreement, in unity. They have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. I mean, these are unsaved people. They don't have Christ. They don't have the Holy Spirit. It's before the New Testament. And God, in the New Testament, God says we, we can do anything through Christ who strengthens us. But this is in the old covenant, unsaved people. And God said, if you release the power of agreement, nothing will be impossible to you. So it just underlines the importance of the principle. But as we said it, it's a principle which means both God and Satan can use it. It's a principle that either God releases good in your life or Satan uses it to steal ground, to take ground and to rob from you, to rob from you. Now this example blows my mind. You have committed Christians, part of the first church. They are active in church life. They've made a decision to follow Christ. They've given their hearts and their lives to Jesus. They've got Jesus living in them. They have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They want to contribute to the congregation, so they sell their land, and, but they lie about the proceeds. So, so just get this quickly again. Saved, Christians, spirit-filled, committed, 
and they unknowingly come into, well, knowingly, come into agreement with a lie. And when you come into agreement with a lie, you come into agreement with the evil one, and he has the right to steal. We live in a culture today that takes the Bible and puts the Bible there. But you know what? This is, this is my opinion. And let's be honest, there's a lot in this book that's not comfortable. There's a lot in this book that we don't like. There's a lot in this book that we actually don't agree with. But if you are not living in agreement with this word, you are going to be living in agreement with the evil one, with the lie and death. So if this book says it's wrong, it's wrong. And if, and if God says, this is what you are supposed to do, we don't really have an option. Because if you don't come into agreement with this word, you are automatically in agreement with the evil one. Let's read Ananias and Sapphira. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property get back some of the price for himself with his wife's full knowledge and bringing a portion of it, he laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not under your control? Why is it that you have conceived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And as he heard these words, Ananias fell down, breathed his last, and great fear came over all who heard of it. Then his wife came in. Peter told her, why have you agreed? Can you see that? There's that, that whole concept, that whole principle again. Why have you agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? I hear the footsteps of those who buried your husband at the door. They are coming here to bury you too. At that moment, she dropped dead at Peter's feet. And when the young men came in, she was already dead. So they carried her out and buried her next to her husband. Spiritful, saved, committed, church-going Christians coming into agreement with a lie. And they lost ground. They lost their lives. So, the power of agreement is truly a transformational force for good or evil in our lives. Job says, agree with God and be at peace. Agree with God and be at peace. And thereby, good will come to you. The second thing that I would like to share with you is, is come into agreement with God's word and his promises. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm sure most of you that is here have received prophecies over the years. Uh, some of the prophecies, they seem so far out. They seem so unreachable. It seems as if they're talking about some of the apostles here, not, not about us ordinary people. Eh? And, and then we tend to think, yeah, that, that will never happen. But we need to come into agreement with the word, with the prophecies, with the promises that God has given us. We need to come into agreement with him. Um, I, listened, I listened to a teaching of Curry Black. He's a Texan in America, and they've got, a, um, they've got an amazing, amazing, well, uh, they claim to have the best healing ministry in the world. But anyway, but he said such a beautiful thing. And he said, before he opens this word, he makes the decision that he's going to believe it. 
He might not understand it. He might not like it. But before he opens this word, he makes the decision that he's going to believe it. That is coming into agreement with the word. And then the word will work for you. Uh, 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 Jeremiah 1.12 says, I'm alert and active over my word to perform it. Uh, Isaiah 55.11 says, my word will not return void to me. But then you need to come into agreement with this word. Um, in some, one of the sessions we, we mentioned Mary, can you just imagine the angel showing up telling Mary, <clears throat> good news, bad news. <laughs> what do you want to hear first? The good news. Okay. So good news, um, you, you're going you're gonna to give life to the Savior, to the Messiah, Yeshua Messiah. You, you, I'm sure a million things went through her mind. She didn't understand it. She didn't know the joy and the pain that it would bring. But she agreed. She believed it. She took it. Um, just a... I have to give you, I gave you such a negative example out of my life. I have to give you a positive one. So, <clears throat> um, a, a picture of my two daughters, um, the eldest one on your left. Um, when we started with our family, uh, the pregnancy was extremely difficult. Um, on 16 weeks, we went for uh, the first uh, examination. Well, not the first, well, it was... Yeah, well, anyway, 16 work examination. <laughs> you, you get it. Yeah. But the gynecologist that we saw at that stage, he was, he was fully booked four months in advance. So you really battled to get an appointment. We saw him, I think it was five o'clock or six, six o'clock that Monday evening. That when we got home, by the time we got home, the phone rang and the secretary said, first thing tomorrow morning, we want to see you. And so the difficulties and the challenges started with the pregnancy. And initially they thought it was a, no matter what I say, spina bifida, spina, you see me say spina bifida. Spina bifida. Thank you, doctor. I say, okay. So initially they thought it was that kind of baby. Uh, <laughs> and then, it, we had a whole journey on 32 weeks. Eloise and, and Imani almost died. Both of them had a high infection rate, was in the hospital. Um, Imani was born prem at 35 weeks. Uh, for almost the next two weeks, um, she was in ICU. And, and, I, and I, I can't begin to tell you that how probably one of the worst things was not to be able to touch your child and pick up your child and hold your child. That was, that was probably one of the, the most difficult things. And now there's, there's quite a few friends and they've all got babies in the same age and it's moms and tots and babes and like baby about Olsni. And, uh, and so we started noticing the kids start crawling, Imani is sitting. And then later, uh, the kids start walking. Imani is not even crawling yet. The kids start speaking, and she's just goo goo ga ga, just goo 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 ga ga the whole time. And she was speaking to, like that up until the age of about three or four. She couldn't she couldn't speak. So at more or less two years of age, we took her to a professional team, and it was an occupational therapist, speech therapist, speech therapist. <laughs> physiotherapist, a doctor, and they had a professional team that ev evaluated her. And we got the devastating news afterwards that your child will always be behind and she will never, ever go to a normal school. Now, as first-time parents, that's devastating. Devastating. At the end of that year, I have a doctor, a doctor friend that was at school with me, 
and he's a doctor in Cape Town, and we went down on holiday to Cape Town, and I told Johan about the symptoms and what was going on, and as a medical doctor, he was listening to me, and, and, and when I had finished, he said, well, listen, Peter, you've got two, you've got two options. You can either believe the doctor's report and listen, our best, our best peace sister. <clears throat> and listen, when I'm saying that, okay. They work, they work with the facts that they have. They work with the facts they have. Uh, they're not a bunch of Satanists. Um, uh, <laughs> Trying to, trying to ruin people's lives. They work with the facts and the knowledge that they had, okay? And my doc, if anybody else had, had told me that, I probably would have smacked them. But as a medical doctor, he said to me, are you going to believe the doctor's report or are you going to believe God's report? And we decided we are going to come into agreement with this report. So we started praying, but we also humanly possibly, uh, we did everything that we could humanly possibly do. So we took her to um, occupational therapy, NLT therapy, physiotherapy, and what was so bad about those sessions, almost each and every session, Imani was crying hysterically. There were days that I, that I was thinking, I'm going to apply the five-fold ministry to this lady. I'm, I'm going to... I to fight, but So, but we prayed and we trusted God. And we did humanly possibly what we could do. Today, she went to a normal school. She went to one of the better schools in our country. Got four distinctions in matric. Went to varsity. And every year they have a Golden Key Award of the, of the top 15% at varsity. In the last three years, she got Golden Key. But God. Amen. But God. But we need to come into agreement. That's the power that is released. Fear is to agree with Satan. And faith is to agree with God. We, we tend to complicate faith and fear. Uh, and, and we tend to complicate faith. You know, we tend to make it difficult. Faith is, faith is actually just, just, just agree. Just come into agreement with us. And you actually don't have an um, other option because if you don't agree with this, you automatically come into agreement with a lie, with the devil, with the evil one that's going to take ground. And you will have no authority unless you agree with the word. We talk a lot about having authority, taking authority, breaking ground, taking regions. You will have no authority. If you don't agree with the word. Okay, this one, this is, a, this is one of my favorites. Um, for the desire that, I, uh, for I have this desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil of that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Who has confessed that in their lives? You know what happens? We come into agreement with that statement. It becomes a license to sin. It becomes a license to sin. Because if Paul couldn't make it, how can I make it? And if he battled, why? As sure as nuts, I'm going to battle. But we forget. He is talking about the law, the old system, the old covenant. The old covenant was there to show you that you can't make it, that you can't do it on your own, that you don't have the ability, that you will never make it. That's so when you come into agreement, make sure you come into agreement with a new covenant. 
not the old covenant. And the law and death. I'm going to skip the next verse. So he actually says, what a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That's our confession. That's our agreement. That's what we believe. When you take the Bible, I'm created in the image of God. I was created to rule and reign. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. The same spirit who rose Jesus Christ from the dead, that same spirit lives within me. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm God's workmanship created anew in Christ Jesus for good works. That's my identity. That's what I need to agree with. And when you agree with your new identity, with a new covenant, you will have Authority. And then just the last thought. Agreement invokes the power of the Holy Spirit and amplifies our prayers. Now this verse, we all know. We all know this verse. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, Read verse 19 with me. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. The one thing that is the worst attended in churches worldwide are prayer meetings. And you know why? Because Christians don't understand the power of agreement. Because when we get together and we agree in prayer, we unleash the power of agreement. So why are you staying away from all the prayer meetings? We we are quick to say, yes, amen, That's, that's a wonderful truth. And then you stay at home. We don't, we don't use, so as if you are married, pray together, unleash the power of agreement. And in a congregation, come together, pray together. Because that's the promise. So does that mean we can get together? We get together. You know what they say, every letter has a letter. Um, how, how would I translate that? Now can I go in with Have you given the translation? Yeah. Okay. Nee, nee, nee. Elke ketter het sy letter. Jy weet, sy elke ou wat die skewe krom idee het, het maar sy versie waar hy vast hou. Ja. Any person... Something out of, yeah, every compromiser can justify his compromise out of the word. He, 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 they always get a piece of scripture to justify. That's more you say. All right, okay, let's go. On. Okay, okay, let's just get this on track again. Are you with me? Oi, here I help us. <laughs> when we when we serve God wholeheartedly, we can start trusting our desires. Because our desires actually comes from him and when we pray in line with his will in line with his word in agreement with his word that promise is true and it will be true in our lives
And then when we come into agreement on the day of Pentecost, on the day Pentecost was being fulfilled, all the disciples were gathered in one place. Suddenly, they heard the sound of a violent blast, a wind of rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. The roar of the wind was so overpowering, it was all anybody could bear. Then all at once, a pillar of fire appeared before their eyes. It separated into tongues of fire that engulfed each one of them. It's, it's a beautiful translation. They were all filled and equipped with the Holy Spirit and were inspired to speak in tongues, empowered by the Spirit to speak in languages they had never learned. But what happened? 120 people for 10 or 13 or 10 days, 10 days, were in agreement, in prayer. And what was released? What was released? What was released? So, three thoughts. The power of agreement can build or destroy your life. Come into agreement with his word, with his prophecies, with his promises. Come into agreement with his word, with his promises, with his prophecies. And agreement will invoke the power of the Holy Spirit and will amplify your prayers. Um, Doug Stringer says, proper alignments with proper agreements, with proper associations and proper attitudes equals kingdom authority. This to me is so profound. Um, last night you, you you had such a beautiful message, Mark, when you when you spoke about the prophets that were eating from Jezebel's table. They were in alliance. They were in agreement. They were in alignment with her lies, with her sin, and what was the end? Proper alignments, proper agreements. Proper associations, proper attitudes equals kingdom authority. One thing to confess, two negative things to stop doing and two positive things to start doing. Number one, if you have unknowingly sought your comfort from death, or if you have believed a lie, or if you are sitting here and you are living in fear, you are actually in agreement with a lie, with the negativity of the evil one, and you need to confess it. Otherwise, he will, he will take ground in your life. Don't agree with any negative words that have been spoken over your life. You will never make it. You will never make a difference. Um, you can't do this. You don't have the ability. You don't have the background. You don't have the schooling. You don't have the anointing. You don't have this. Don't agree with those negative words. This is not positive thinking. Come in line. Come into agreement with your heavenly identity. And then don't agree with your fears. Joyce Meyer's got a book, Do It Afraid. I haven't read, read it. I've just seen the title. As Christians, we, we sometimes just do it afraid. I, I, I love the, the piece of scripture. Um, I'm going to butcher it now. but uh, You get so many instances in the Old Testament where they, where they enter a fight. And the, God, the guy says, well, I'm not 100% sure when the God is with me, but here goes. And if, if we prevail, we know God was with us, you know. But they did it afraid. And then we've said it a few times. Agree. Agree with God's words, promises, prophecies, dreams that he's given you. And I would like to challenge you. Start agreeing with someone in prayer about your challenges, about your fears, about your business, about your family. Let's unleash the power.
proud of the green so that we can start making ground for the kingdom, for our king, for him. I know that I know that there is people here today that are on the verge of giving up. I know that God, God showed me that. And listen, I embarrassed myself at the beginning by sharing on a platform a highly embarrassing story. But if you are here today and you are thinking of giving up, giving up, and it might be on, in different areas. It might be giving up on your kids. It might be giving up on your dreams. It might, you might be sitting here and thinking, I'm giving up on my marriage. I'm giving up on my business. I'm giving up on this prophecy. I'm giving up on this word. I've prayed. I've been around this mountain so many times. I've prayed about this thing so many times. Lord, when is the breakthrough coming? When is my business changing around? When is the breakthrough coming in my business, in my finances, in my health, in my relationships, in my, in my relationship with you? I know that there's quite a few people here that are on the verge of giving up. There's a few people here. Listen, ministry after COVID has been tough. It's not been easy. There's a few of you that are here that, that actually feel I'm giving up on ministry. I've fasted, I've prayed, I've sowed, I've done all the right things and the breakthroughs are not coming out. I'm going to walk away. If you are there today, I would like you to stand. I asked a few of our esteemed members in the congregation just to pray with me. And I would like you to come to the front, being concerned on the unseen one. Debbie, Irma. Um, I'm going to ask you to come to the front. And then we're just going to pray for you. We're just going to minister to you. Sorry, may I ask you guys to, to pray with us if you don't mind? Thank you. Apostle David, would you mind praying with us for the people here? Thank you. You are an ethos in the song competition. I am a Neil Sonia in the song competition. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say a prayer for, for the for the big group and then I'm just gonna ask you guys just to minister to them individually. Father, we come and in the name of Jesus, we bring each and everybody that is here today, we bring them to you, Father. And we pronounce, we call out the name of Jesus. We call out the name of Jesus over their businesses. We call out the name of Jesus over, over their, their, their soul dimensions in their life. We call out the name of Jesus over their dreams. We call out the name of Jesus over their kids. We call out the name of Jesus over their marriages. We call out the name of Jesus over their bodies. And we declare... We declare in the name of Jesus, there will be a breakthrough. There will be a breakthrough. There will be a breakthrough in the name of Jesus, Father. Father, we pray that you will cover them with the blood of Jesus. And we pray, Father, that you will command your angels to surround them and that you will protect them against the evil and the evil one, Father. So I'm just going to give the team um, opportunity just to pray for each of you.